you see the pain. You've seen it, you've felt it in your own lives. But uh, you're now going all over the country and you're speaking at Love One Out conferences. And the purpose is not to, uh, you know, propagandize or, or uh, attack the homosexual movement. It is to reach out to those who are hurting. What are you hearing, John? Uh, what are people saying to you out there? Well, we have a very difficult job because as Doctor alluded to earlier, our, our country has been brainwashed very successfully to believe that this is an unchangeable condition. People are extremely skeptical, even those within the church. However, the few men and women, and there's probably less than 25 of them, that are willing to put their lives on the line and speak out. And we have ministered through Focus on the Family for almost four years in the Love Went Out ministry that we do around the country. And the, the largest audience are parents, people like you, who love their children desperately. But no family's perfect. And we all make mistakes. And these parents come up to us crying, mm -hmm. put their arms around us and say, you represent the hope for my son or daughter. And that's why we need to support this kind of work. There are very few people that are willing to stand up. Dr. Dobson's one of the few evangelical leaders that will stick his neck out and his head's always being chopped off by the media and even the church. We don't want to face this, but we must. Because even though for the past 20 years the percentage of homosexuality has hovered around 3%, I'm convinced, and those, those of us that study this, feel it's going to increase because as Dr. Dobson said, children are impressionable and the gay activists are going after mm -hmm. your children. Not too long ago, I was speaking in a church in Ohio of 2,000 people and I was talking about what the governor in California did in signing this legislation into law. And as I announced it, there was this blank stare from the congregation and I got upset. And I said, did you hear what I said? Children are being taught that this is normal. That should anger you. That should upset you. That should motivate you to do something. And unfortunately, the church today, oftentimes, sadly, is so apathetic. So hopefully this video, Dr. Dobson's book, and what we're doing is going to make a difference. 40% of the constituents that come to our conference, the Love One Out conference, are family members of those that are gay or lesbian. You can imagine the joy that John and I experience when the mother comes up to us, tears streaming down her face and says, thank you for giving me permission to love my gay son. That breaks my heart because I think where has she ever gotten the message that she doesn't have permission to love her gay son because that's what he's investing in. And so that just keeps us going. Mm -hmm. uh, John and I have often talked about, even as I, I joked about earlier, that we'd love to be flipping burgers, but how can we stop this message? It's so vital, it's so important, it keeps us going. Um, my wife is, is very supportive of this and she speaks about her issues as well, where we can admit our faults, where we can admit our flaws, because that's truly when the healing is gonna take place. And I feel bad, Dr. Dobson, actually, for people that aren't able to express as John and I are uh, and have to keep those secrets. When we go to the conferences and speak, people say, I don't know why I came. I came because this was a focus on the family event. But afterwards, they'll come up to us and say, you know what, I've hidden an adulterous affair in my life for years, and you've given me hope to see that the church will embrace me and will love me if I confess this, and I'm hoping to find the same freedom that you have. You know, when the uh, Love One Out conference comes to a given uh, city, there's usually an organized opposition. The media gets upset and there are pickets and so on. And some of those folks, uh, the homosexuals, come in and listen to you. What happens at well, I'll the end? I'll tell you about the last conference we had just three weeks ago in Atlanta, Georgia. What we wanted to do when we started this in 1998 was present education to give people something they couldn't find anywhere else. And that, that's, a, that's a lot of fun that we have something that you don't have and we want to give that to you. But as time went by, we found that as our conference day ended, there was something missing mm -hmm. and something left out. So we decided we would give people an opportunity. The last conference, we, we gave this and I spent some time explaining to people what had happened during the day. 75 people walked forward out of a crowd of 600. I went off the stage, went back, talked to the speakers. An hour later when we were leaving, 
there were still people up front. Mm -hmm. And when we asked those that prayed for those individuals, who said, what were people coming forward for? It was for a variety of reasons. Heterosexual fornication. Um, Repenting of their hatred towards gay men and gay women. Right. People saying, no longer am I going to be silent. I'm going to talk about this. Tremendous blessing. I'll never forget another conference. A lesbian couple walked forward and mm -hmm. said, we want to give our lives to Christ. We want to change. We want to overcome lesbianism. So it is such an honor to do something of this magnitude, even in a world that doesn't believe it. And as I told Dr. Dobson the other day, sometimes the only thing that keeps our staff going is knowing he's standing behind us. Amen. And when you have a father figure who's willing to stand behind you and support you, you can do things that are very difficult. John, I think we must tell our friends about your failure a year or two ago. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and how it happened. You never have gone back into the homosexual life. You've never had sex outside of marriage, but there was something inside. Explain what happened very, very quickly. Yeah, a little over a year ago, I, my, my work here at Focus had become so stressful. As you can imagine, we're in the forefront of the media. We, when you've been on the cover of Newsweek magazine, you walk in the grocery store, and there you are, and your parents see it, and your friends from high school see it, and the headline is Gay for Life, and you feel like hiding under a rock, and you're being attacked. Well, I had come to the place in my ministry where I felt like I could not be vulnerable anymore. Because we're so disbelieved, I felt like I had to have my act totally together, that I couldn't struggle with homosexuality, that I couldn't be tempted, so I pushed those temptations and struggles underground and I didn't talk about them anymore. Mm -hmm. And when I was in Washington, D.C. on a trip for focus, my temptation and my curiosity got the best of me, and that rebellious spirit crawled up in me, and I went into a homosexual bar. And I thought, I have not even been tempted to do this for 15 years. Why am I here? And as I sat on this bar stool, I started talking to another man who I noticed had a wedding ring on. And I said, why are you here? You're married. He goes, well, you're married too. Well, someone spotted me in there and, of course, blasted it all over the media. And what happened was God took me through a very healing journey of cleansing and repentance and forgiveness and discipline. And brokenness. And brokenness. And really, I have to say at this point, having you never realize how much your wife loves you until you go through something so difficult. And to see Christians not sugarcoat things, but to say in the midst of this, we need to get you counseling, we will give you support, you will be accountable. I am, I am a better man today than I ever was before. And I think it's good because people have to see us that we are vulnerable, all of us as Christians, but then we can go on after making a mistake. Thank you, gentlemen. And would you all get me here? Well, at the end of our time, last time, uh, we were beginning to talk about the origins of homosexuality, especially in uh, early child development. And uh, when that subject comes up, one name stands before me as the foremost authority on this topic, and his name is Dr. Joseph Nicolosi. Dr. Nicolosi is a, is a psychologist in private practice. He's a clinical uh, psychologist, and he has uh, just written a book uh, called Preventing Homosexuality that gets into those developmental factors, and I think you will find this very, very enlightening in understanding uh, where this developmental problem originates and how we can deal with it. And so let me welcome now, and would you help me welcome, Dr. Joseph Nicolosi. Now, last time we were hearing from uh, John Pauk and Mike, Haley about their own experience as, uh, as former homosexuals and the struggles they had as children. Uh, 
Describe um, for our audience here and for those who are watching on video what was going on there. How did they get in difficulty and, and why did they take that turn mm -hmm. uh, and why have so many millions of others taken the same path? Well, it's interesting because John and um, Mike offered two kinds of father patterns that are negative. One was an absent father who just did not get involved, and one was a critical father. And those are the two combinations we talk about, emotionally distant or critical father. And that's the two combinations that we try to avoid, rather than an affirming father. Uh, of the mother and the father, both of them are important in terms of the formation of the boy's identity. But we put the emphasis on the father, because the boy has to make that bonding with the father. You have written in your book, and again, it's not yet published, but I hope when it is, that every parent of boys and girls will read your book. It is that significant, and you've allowed me to quote uh, quite a bit of it in uh, my book, Bringing Up Boys. But you have talked about uh, homosexuality as a developmental problem, mm -hmm. uh, that it occurs from the relationship between the mother and the father, mm -hmm. typically. Mm -hmm. Now, there's child abuse and there's mm -hmm. all kinds of other things that are going on. But describe that primary relationship difficulty that leads in this direction. Well, basically, both boys and girls are first identified with the mother. The mother is the primary love object for the boy and the girl. But the boy has the additional developmental task of disidentifying with the mother and connecting with the father. And that's extra work for him to do, which the girl doesn't have to do. The girl maintains her primary relationship with the mother, and that's where she gets her femininity from. Um, and so when the boy has to disconnect uh, with the mother and connect with the father, you need both the cooperation of the mother and the father. The mother has to be willing to let him go, and the father has to welcome him. And when you have an imbalance in one of those two, you can have problems. This is called the, um, the gender identity phase. We're talking about really one and a half to three years old. It's a very critical time when the boy discovers that the world is divided between male and female, and which one will he be? Yeah. You, in fact, talked in your book uh, about the fact that boys are not born knowing how to be male. Exactly. They have to learn that. It's an, it's a, um, uh, Robert Stoller said, masculinity is an accomplishment. It's an achievement. And this might explain why we have more male homosexuality than lesbianism. Some people say two to one, five to one, seven to one, because it's easier to be female than it is to be male. If you do nothing, the male will not become masculine. Something has to happen. We, you know, in so-called primitive societies, we, we have rights of initiation, male initiation rights, but we don't have that. We, we're losing sight of that. Everything is, is um, co-ed activities. So the boy needs special help in making that masculine adjustment. Well, let me put that into my words and then you comment on it. Um, at the moment of birth, of course, the mother is extremely important to the boy and continues that way until about 18 months of age. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, most mothers can attest to the fact that they can feel and see the boy begin to pull back from her just a little bit. And in a normal uh, developmental process, uh, he gradually um, detaches from her and then differentiates his um, self-concept, his gender identity, by linking himself to his father. Occurring very, very early. Very, 18 very months. early. 18 months. All right. And from there to five years of age, mm -hmm. that role modeling occurs. The mm -hmm. father is desperately needed at that time to affirm that boy, to care for him, to teach him what it means to be a man. Many men, many boys of all ages have no clue what it means to be masculine because they've never seen it modeled. Exactly. It's certainly not on television. They have not seen it in the movies, and many of them have not seen it at home. And the problem is that we also have to avoid cliches and stereotypes of what masculinity and femininity is. The example of the boy cooking, and he'd rather cook than go fishing, as someone was saying that in the camping situation, that's okay. We don't have to make the boy feel bad about that, as long as you have an emotional connection with the boy. If the boy feels good about the father, we talk about father salience. Salience has two characteristics, benevolence and strength. The boy has to see the father as good and strong. And if the boy sees the father as good and strong, he will normally and naturally want to do what the father does. And that's how he takes on the masculinity. It's not the stereotypic behaviors, but a more of a sense of, of who he is, basically. Hmm. 
I saw it in uh, our own home, and I think I've, I've mentioned this uh, already in one of the videos, that when our son was five years of age, we would go out uh, to get in the car. We were going, the whole family was going to uh, go to eat. And there are four of us, a boy and a girl, and Shirley and me. And Ryan would very typically say, hey, Dad, I'd say what? He'd say, uh, us guys will sit in the front seat. Uh, the girls will sit in the back seat. Now, he wasn't lording this over his sister and his mother. He was saying, I'm like you. I'm a guy like you. Us guys are going to sit in the front seat. I have and, little... and that was a healthy thing. You know, he was identifying with me. He's mm -hmm. saying, I want to be a man like you. Mm -hmm. A little twist on that, my interpretation is the first time I've heard this. I think he was loading it over that the boy has to feel... <laughs> Well, I didn't want to say that. <laughs> Part of being a boy is feeling that being a boy is special. You're lucky to be a boy. And I know that sounds chauvinistic, and we'll, we'll teach him later about reality. But right now, at that, <laughs> at that point, he really needs to feel that it's special. You know what? Uh, I affirm that. We, uh, <laughs> uh, I went to a hunting trip in South Dakota recently, and there are about 20 people there. And I've done this for seven or eight years. I go every year with about 20 guys. And this year was the first year that the women have been invited, and a few sisters. And, uh, and some of the, the boys that are, that are invited are pretty young. One of them was 11 years of age, and he deeply resented that. Exactly. He resented the yeah. fact that the women were invited. Now, it really, it was made for a very fun trip. You know, they, some of the women hunted and some of them stayed in the lodge, but it was neat having them there. So I didn't object to that, but he did, and I understood it. And he felt like, man, this is a guy thing. This is something us guys do together. And he, he resented the fact that his that. sister and his mother were invited to, uh, to come along. And this is why this, this co-ed activity is really not such a healthy thing, I think. Boys need to be separate to affirm their masculinity. They need to be away from girls, have that distance, so that they can be so solid in their masculinity that then they can return to women, but return to them as men. So it's like a pendulum. You leave the mother, you deepen your sense of masculinity, and then with that, you can return to women and, and be in relationship with them. All right. Now, the question that begs to be asked is with regard to prevention. You've written a book called Preventing Homosexuality. Uh, the question is how. Uh, what do you do when a family comes to you and they've got an effeminate boy, he wants to wear girls' clothing, uh, he is beginning to sound and talk mm -hmm. and look like a girl. What do you do when the family comes to you? First of all, basically what I really wind up doing is telling parents to do what in their gut they want to do. They know there's something wrong with it. They want to take action, but they're intimidated. They're getting mixed messages. They're getting confused messages from the media, from teachers, from other counselors. They said, don't do anything. Your son is gay. Uh, if you try to change him, he'll be traumatized, et cetera, et cetera. We give the opposite advice. Father, get more involved. Mother, back off. And consistently tell your son he's a boy. And when the boy does something effeminate, you say, you don't want to do that. That's what girls do, and you're a boy. And being a boy is special. So That's you're not shaming him. No, you, you now, avoid the shaming. Yeah. yeah. But you are teaching him that it's, there is that something. Being a boy is special, and mommy and daddy love you and are happy when you're a boy. And what we can accomplish in three or four months with the cooperation of mother and father takes years to be done with adult homosexuals. Now, that's a problem for both mothers and fathers. Mm -hmm. For mothers, they feel rejected when they see they their sons pull back. They do. And for fathers, a particular boy might not be a good fit with that father. Mm -hmm. A particular boy may have a sensitive spirit, may not be able to throw a football, may not sound like a boy. And the tendency of that father is, is to pull back himself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if that right. happens, then the boy is going to gravitate Absolutely. to the safe place. Absolutely. The father has to go against his inclination to be turned off by the boy's effeminacy. And, you know, we talk about how the mothers are resistant to give up their sons, but I can tell you, I'm glad I have an opportunity to do it on video, the, the fathers are the most resistant. Mothers, if you give them a program, they'll do it.
but the, but the fathers are most resistant. They just don't do what they need to do. Why, Joseph? At their personality, or they, uh, it strikes something inside of themselves, some, some insecurities or in inferiorities, or doubts about their own masculinity. But even though these fathers are shocked when I tell them that there's a statistically a 75% correlation between boyhood effeminacy and adult homosexuality or bisexuality or transvestitism, and so they're shocked to hear the statistic, but they just don't do it. And I have to continuously coach these fathers to get involved with their sons and make that emotional connection. I hope you all heard what he just said, because you won't read that anywhere else. Where you have a very effeminate boy who is beginning to show signs of this uh, gender identity crisis. Now you call it pre-homosexuality. It's a pre-homosexual condition. There is a 75% chance that that boy will go on to develop full-blown homosexuality. Absolutely. Especially if he goes to school and he hears... Oh, then it'll be affirmed. Yeah. And you have a window there that you can deal with it. Absolutely. Can it be prevented? Absolutely. Absolutely. If you have the cooperation of mother and father, if they work together as a parental team, you can turn these boys around in about three or four months. In my book, Bringing Up Boys, uh, in the chapter called The Origins of Homosexuality, which leans very heavily on Dr. Nicolosi, uh, I quoted a letter that was sent to me a while back uh, from a boy, and this is what he wrote to me, and I would like to read it. He's 13 years old, and I would like you to comment on what's going on here. If you have no compassion for homosexuals, listen to this letter and tell me how you would feel if this was your son. Dear Dr. Dobson, I've been putting this off for a long time, so I'm finally writing you a letter. I'm a 13-year-old boy. I've listened to your tapes preparing for adolescence, but not the complete set. I did listen to the one on sex, though. Getting to the point, I don't know if I have a serious problem or one that's passing. All through my life, which is very short, I have acted and I look much more like a girl than a boy. When I was little, I would always wear fingernail polish and dresses and the sort. I also had an older cousin who would take us as little cousins into his room and show us his genitals. I'm afraid I have a little sodomy in me. It was very hard for me to write what I just did. I don't want to be a homosexual, but I'm afraid, very afraid. That was hard to write, too. Let me explain further. Through my higher grades in school, I'm in the seventh grade, kids have always called me names, gay, fag, and so on. That seems to go along with it, doesn't it? And made fun of me. It's been hard. I have masturbated, I guess, and gone too far. He then describes some behavior that I won't uh, subject you to. That sounds very bad and looks even worse to read it. I pray that nothing is wrong with me. Very recently, I've done such acts as looking, maybe lusting, at myself in skimpy underwear. Whenever I wear it, I feel like sexual sensation. Yesterday in the bathroom in front of the mirror, I wiggled my body very rapidly, making my genitals bounce up and down. I get a little bit of that feeling mentioned above as I write this. After I did this, I immediately asked God to forgive me. I went into the shower, but did it again there. I prayed more, and I felt very bad. Listen to the conflict that's going on in this boy, and especially with regard to guilt and his relationship with God. I talked with one of my pastors, and I told him at that point that I probably preferred a man's body over a woman. Now, that was hard to say. He said he didn't think anything was wrong with me. I don't know how else to say it. He apparently thought it was passing, but I felt very badly, and I want to know why. The pastor mentioned above is one that I go to for advice very often. I have been baptized, and I'm well-liked in church, I think. I'm afraid that if I'm not straight, that's much easier to write, I will go to hell. I don't want to be not straight. I don't try to be not straight. I love God and I want to go to heaven. If something is wrong with me, I want to get rid of it. Please 
help me? Mark, <laughs> what, what agony at 13 agony. years of age. It's so painful. Now, his pastor told him that it's just passing. Of course, because he, he didn't know advice. what else to say. Yeah. And he didn't know what else to say because we're not training pastors and we're not training counselors what to say. They just don't know what to say. What would you have said to him if he'd come to well, you? Well, first of all, you hear the pain. I tell clients when they come in, your problem is not your homosexuality. Homosexuality is not about sex. Homosexuality is about a deep sense of pain, a deep sense of alienation. This is a very lonely, suffering kid. Where are his parents? That's the first thing that came to my mind when he was putting the nail polish on. So it's, there's an emotional pain. And sex is used to cover up the pain, the pain of alienation, the pain of feeling different, the pain of feeling weak. And I really, when I do this work, we get the shift away from homosexuality and focus on the pain. And the pain is not belonging, not feeling connected. That's why it's not a sexual problem, it's a gender problem, it's an identity problem. Well, if his parents had read the literature that's out there today or had well, watched right. television, mm -hmm. they would have believed, first of all, that mm -hmm. this was a genetic difficulty, mm -hmm. and secondly, that if they didn't encourage it, that they would warp him forever. Well, well we're seeing the benefits of, of this um, sort of parenting. I mean, mm -hmm. the kid is still unhappy. Could you have helped that 13-year-old? Oh, definitely. Definitely. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And to, to show him, first of all, again, that it's about that sense of pain and alienation that's your real problem. We talked uh, earlier about pre-homosexuality. Uh, in your book, which I've quoted here, you said there are five characteristics that parents need to look for mm -hmm. in that condition. Mm -hmm. And then if they see those characteristics, they really need to address them and get help from somebody who understands what you have talked about. Number one, repeatedly stated desire to be or insistence that he or she is the other sex. Two, in boys, preference for cross-dressing or simulating female attire, and in girls, insisting on wearing only stereotypical masculine clothing. Number three, strong and persistent preference for cross-sexual roles in make-believe play or persistent fantasies of being the other sex. Number four, intense desire to participate in stereotypical games and pastimes of the other sex. And number five, a strong preference for playmates of the other sex. When you see those five, there's a problem developing. Big problem. In fact, you can have a problem without that graphic, even let more subtle, you can have a problem. I put out the very uh, graphic um, signs for parents to, to pay attention to. And when you see those five, there is a 75% chance. If you do nothing, that he if will. If you do nothing, he will go on to become homosexual. That's why we call it a pre homosexual child. Mm. Yeah. What else do you want to tell us with the remaining moments? Say uh, anything you want to suggest to parents. Uh, and grandparents who are here, this is something not known. It's yeah, not understood. I, I, I mean, you. this is new information in the culture. It's not out there. And yet, you have a lifetime of experience exactly. to document it. Yeah. Well, another thing I would just say is if there's any doubts that homosexuality, the gay lifestyle, is normal and natural, I can tell you we've done the research, our organization has done the research, there is much more pathology, much more self-defeating, self-destructive, maladaptive behaviors in people who label themselves gay compared to heterosexuals in terms of sexual activities, drug, drug abuse, alcohol abuse. I, we can go on and on and on. We did a big study, and it really has a lot of unhappiness associated with it. Joseph, in your work as a clinical psychologist, it must be very, very gratifying to uh, deal with somebody like John or Mike or the others who have been heavily into the homosexual lifestyle, to come up and out of that mm -hmm. and to be whole again. Mm -hmm and especially to introduce them to Jesus Christ. And especially to be told by the American Psychiatric Association that you can't do this. Yeah. <laughs> and we're doing it. That's right. They have actually tried exactly. to pass uh, yes, regulations. Exactly. Well, what I do every day in therapists like me do is against the American Psychiatric Association. And the American Psychological Association. the American Association. Psychological Association is also. Yeah, under heavy, heavy lobbying exactly. from the homosexual community. Yes. So science gives way now. 
uh, to you know. politics. Any questions from the audience, okay? What advice would you give to a single mom who has a sensitive boy and um, the father is either absent or, in worst case scenario, gay himself? Mm. Um, again, you have more work to do because you don't have a father around. So um, you have to affirm his masculinity. You have to make him feel good as a boy, not only as your child in the neutered sense, but as your, your son, as your boy. Also, I would try to find some father figure, um, maybe um, an older brother, your father, uh, a father figure who can get more involved with this boy if the father is not being involved. I uh, uh, did 20 interviews in a row the other day on this book. They were about four minutes in length and one minute between. These were televised interviews. And so they were all over the country. They were live interviews that were part of the news program around the country. And that question that you've asked was asked by almost every one of them because it's the obvious thing that's happening out there. There's so many single mothers. Uh, you know, the, the number of households headed by single mothers increased 25% just between 1990 and, and 2000. And that question comes up. How are we going to raise healthy boys? And you can find role models for them, but you have to work hard to find them. And you can't do it. Mm -hmm. I, I hate to say it. You're not equipped to show a boy what it means to be a man because you've never been there. Now, most women were little girls when they were young. And so you can't do that. So this is why I support the Boy Scouts as I do. That is a wonderful organization, and it's also why they're under attack, because it is for political reasons. Boy Scouts, boys clubs, uh, church youth groups, youth pastors who are male and uh, who are confident in who they are and who will affirm your boys. School teachers, coaches, organized sports. Uh, there are so many places that you can get it. But you absolutely have to get it. An uncle, as you said, or, or a neighbor, or someone who can show your boy what it means to be male. You've got to find that, don't you? And also not to trash your husband or your ex-husband. A lot of women feel very hurt that they're not getting child support, and they will complain to the boy about this father. The, the boy has a need to see the father positively, so you have to try to with, withhold that temptation to, to criticize the father in front of the boy. Okay, another question. When I graduated in 1973 at the State University of California, uh, we had an expert give a class. Uh, we took a class on sexuality. My wife, uh, Carla, was able to come to that class. Uh, we had a specialist on homosexuality, and what he spoke to is exactly what you've said, the truth, okay, what you just said. What I'd like to know is what's happened since that time. Has it been politically that, that's changed this? I mean, exactly. obviously in 1973, if they known what you know, we've gone a long way here. Yeah, exactly. You said 1973. It's a very interesting that you said 1973. That was the year that the American Psychiatric Association changed the diagnosis and said that homosexuality was now normal. And that was a total political decision. I mean, they basically, in one day, in one vote, swept away uh, like at least a hundred years of literature and uh, this is a political position so since 1973 forward there's been a very intimidating effect you can't do research you can't get your uh, research published we've tried to get some things published we, we get a great deal of resistance uh, it's not being taught in the graduate schools I did not learn anything from the graduate school that I, that I graduated from. I learned from my clients, from what my clients were telling me. I began to put the pieces together and then went back into the early literature and found that there was a whole wealth of literature on the, on the cause and treatment of homosexuality that nobody talks about. It's very interesting, too, that the man who was most responsible for that decision in 1973 by the American Psychiatric Association, Dr. Spitzer, That's right. uh, has now recanted. He's come around. And he has had the courage to say I was wrong. 
but he was vilified for doing that within the profession. The one person who's responsible for that decision is Dr. Robert Spitzer. And recently, in a couple of months ago, he said, if my son was gay, I would hope that he would go to therapy for change. Now, of course, he angered his, <laughs> his supporters, his gay supporters, but he's been coming around. And he also said that he felt that as someone who was instrumental in changing the 73 decision to normalize homosexuality, he feels that he was somewhat responsible for the spread of AIDS. Mm. Interesting. And he is Jewish. Jewish. And he is very religious, liberal. Very liberal. And he would not agree with us on anything. And he was able to find 200 people who had successfully come out of homosexuality and had made a heterosexual adjustment. There's the hope, folks. They can beat it if they get the proper treatment, but it's hard. It's hard. I, it's I think it was therapy. really wrong to imply that it's this is therapy. duck soup because it's not. It's very, very difficult. And that's why I'm so proud of the, the two gentlemen on our staff, uh, John Polk and Mike Haley, because they've invested the hard work necessary mm -hmm. uh, to, to accomplish this. Now, the pain is so deep when you see your friends who have homosexual children buy the lie. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They will, they will uh, accept what their gay child tells them that, well, it's impossible to change. Exactly. So you just got to accept me the way I am. Exactly. So they say, okay, I love you, son, but uh, we'll not accept the fact that change can occur. Exactly. How, what kind of intervention, what is possible to break the cycle of that uh, buying the lies? Um, you could tell them that change is possible, that you've heard about it, you've, you've, you've heard people speak, you've read books, you've, you've attended seminars, you know that people can change. And if they're honest with you, they'll tell you, I never felt connected to my father, I never felt my father really loved me, I was too enmeshed with my mother, I found that I had to be involved with my mother to meet her emotional needs. I always felt different, even before I had homosexual feelings. There are certain things that are in place even before homosexuality becomes an issue. And if they're honest, they'll start to see that there were these preceding causal factors and that homosexuality is only a final outcome. But, but you're, you're fighting a culture. I mean, <laughs> what you can do in five minutes, they, they're watching the media and tell, and internet is also very, very dangerous. Gay chat lines, and it, it just goes on and on. And all the pornography, pornography that's there, which is doing incredible damage. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I came from a very promiscuous background, heterosexually, and when I accepted Christ and got married, yeah, I still had some temptation, but certainly not or something I could not overcome and yet I hear continuously how difficult it is for a homosexual to move out of that lifestyle mm -hmm. and I, I'm, I guess I'm troubled and I'm confused as to why once they've gone to the therapy and once they recognize the cause of it why is it so difficult to come out of it whereas from a heterosexual promiscuity, it doesn't seem to be that difficult. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great question. Good question. Very good question. Two reasons. First of all, you're not fighting the culture like these individuals are fighting. You're not seeing heterosexually promiscuous characters be on, on television, on the media, being glorified. That's number one. So, and, and you're not being told across the board that you can't change. This is who you are. So that's the first thing. You're not fighting a culture. Second thing is, again, we go back to the original hurt. This is not about sexuality. This is about identity, core gender identity, which they continually try to relieve the pain of through, through uh, homosexual behavior. So it's a really a deeper core. You know, what's interesting to me, uh, Joseph, is that um, the intensity of homosexuality compared to heterosexuality mm -hmm. uh, is almost off the chart. It is off the chart. Uh, you know, and, and that's an interesting question too because what heterosexual do you know whose politics is determined by their sexual activity, whose uh, reading material, whose vacations and trips, whose work assignment and whose passion in everything they do is governed by their sexuality. Exactly. Where does that intensity come from? Because that goes to the question we were just asked. It goes to a desperate attempt to solidify and reinforce a lie. 
That's basically it. They have bought a lie that cannot be substantiated biologically in nature in any other way. And they are continually promoting, it's like a cult. In many ways, you can make the argument that the gay community is a cult in the sense that it's a false idea that is constantly being reinforced. Um, Anne Hayes, who left uh, Ellen DeGeneres, she came to realize that she was not lesbian and she has been tortured by the media because she's no longer the idealized model of the lesbian. And um, so there's a constant need to really punish the person who wants to leave. And linked with it all is the pain of early childhood and that sexual identity crisis. Well, thank you all for participating with us uh, today and, and on the previous uh, video. Uh, Dr. Nicolosi, you're a national treasure and I appreciate what you stand for. I pray that a large secular publishing house will publish your book uh, there's a lot of resistance to it, and the big houses are leery because they'll be vilified if they do that. I'm uh, thinking that you're a national treasure. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, everyone.